Hello and welcome to the OP Overwatch Podcast. I am your host, Jam, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jeff. How you doing, man? Hey, what's up? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. A uh, lot to talk about. I've been uh, spending a lot of time in that PTR and uh, pl- playing a lot of quick play matches. Really exciting things going on. There's a lot to talk about today. Yeah, actually, uh, I've noticed an interesting trend. I wanted to get your opinion right off the bat. We're uh, in the middle of uh, the break between Season 1 and Season 2 Competitive. How has it been going for you? Have you noticed any changes uh, in your quick play since everyone's been funneled back into the same game mode? (laughs) Yeah, actually, I definitely have. Um, It's kind of weird in Overwatch having this sort of, I guess you could call it an off-season where we're not having competitive. Because with the competitive mode versus quick play, you usually saw the super try-hard players uh, in competitive mode. And then people a little more casual or having fun trying out new characters in quick play. Now, with competitive mode being down for a while in this off season, we're seeing the both of those crowds combining. So, um, in my personal experience, it's been really weird because I've been having more so than usual either really, really good matches or absolutely terrible matches. And by terrible matches, I mean like terrible comps, no healers, people that are just in the chat log complaining the entire time, and uh, it's it's. Uh, I wouldn't say, in for the most part, it's good. You know, it's still Overwatch. It's still a fun time. But every once in a while, you have those super negative matches. And for whatever reason, it, you're, it, it's like everybody's just kind of butting heads based on what their goal is in the game. So that's kind of been my experience. How about you? Yeah, my first thought about how it's been going lately, I've been wondering why there's so many 12-year-olds all of a sudden in all my games. Um, I mean, it's just... <laughs> A lot of gloating, a lot of smack talking, and it just doesn't, I don't know, everyone's just kind of being jerks to each other, so... A lot of GGEZ. I, yeah, well, hopefully uh, they keep doing that after the patch, because then it's going to get filtered into something more pleasant. It's actually um, funny you say that. On the PTR, um, I just had recently finished a match in Eichenwald, and uh, we ended up winning the match, and there were a bunch of those... Uh, Modified. In case we didn't mention it before, they're going to modify a bunch of the GGEZ comments in the chat log. I don't know if they plan on keeping it. I hope they do, and it changes it to um, more embarrassing quotes like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be a nicer person, I'm really trying, and things like that. I saw a whole bunch of that in the chat log, so uh, it, it seems to be working to some degree. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing to... Have something that people just feel the need to like rub it in people's faces. Obviously, everyone knows how the match went. Like, I don't need to tell you that it was easy at the end if I dominated you. <laughs> uh, there, there's there's nothing gained from that. So I love that Blizzard's filtering that out. I'm sure that people will find another thing they can say just to be a bunch of jerks about it. But I don't quite understand why that's such a compelling behavior but yeah i really don't uh, get why it's necessary it's one of those things where i guess it just makes people feel better you know some people they have they put so much on this single game because they're miserable in real life that they feel like oh let me rub it in this person's face and then i'll feel good about myself for about 10 seconds i don't know to me it just adds toxicity to the game there's really not a need for it but you know it's if you're playing online in any game you're always going to have some percentage of the population that's going to do that yeah, I mean, I think it's just a byproduct of online gaming and, and the lack of accountability with the internet. I mean, if you went to the park and played basketball and, and then after the game you said GG easy, you'd get punched in the face. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't, you don't have to worry about that with an online game. So, But you mentioned uh, the PTR. Uh, I got a chance to jump on and play a little Eichenwald, and I know you did as well. What were your first impressions of the new map once we got hands-on with it? Oh my god, where do I start? The map is awesome. I mean, I was already very excited for it being a German map and a castle, very medieval type feel. Uh, At this point of the podcast, uh, we've already seen The Last Bastion, which is the latest animated short, which actually takes place on the same, uh, well, not on the same map per se, but in the same area. It does take place in Germany. You can see Eichenwald in the back. So uh, obviously just a very gorgeous, gorgeous landscape. But on top of all that, um, very interesting for a map. You can actually uh, flank and jump in on your opponents. There's a lot of places for you to post up for sniping or turrets and um, just all sorts of interesting areas, not only in the village before the castle, but in the castle itself. And yeah, I'm really excited about the map. I've 
from the little I've tried with it, who knows if they're going to make any balancing changes to it based on the PTR. But I got to say, two thumbs up for sure on the Eichenwald because it is a whole lot of fun. I will say that the... Um, the few matches I've played, I've definitely had a lot more luck on attack versus defense. I don't know if that's a map balance issue or more of a, you know, everybody's new to the map, so not everyone's quite as sure where to go or or maybe getting knocked off in places they don't expect to because there are a lot of cliffs and valleys that you could fall down accidentally or if you get knocked off. So um, all that aside, it's really a fun, interesting map, both visually pleasing and just gameplay wise, a blast to play. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. I, the first thing I noticed when I loaded into the spawn room, uh, it was like an, an old school pub, but it seemed like there was a, a map in the middle, like a strategy or battle plan. And uh, it kind of gave me a little bit more context on on what Eichenwald is and Apparently, it was kind of the last stand before Stuttgart, where they kind of they held off the Omnics, and so that's why it looks like a, a war zone because it very much was one. Just kind of cool to to have more context and to be able to picture, you know, why they were fighting there and what was at stake. But as far as the map itself, yeah, I mean, my first impression it felt huge, like the biggest map so far, probably. And just a total playground. I mean, just trying out like some some of these tunnels and exploring it, and, and everything around the uh, the bridge that passes over uh, where the battering ram knocks the door in. You can just visualize the epic battles that are going to take place there because I mean, there's there's so many ways to uh, get environmental kills around it, and there's so many vantage points. I really am excited to get this into the full rotation. I did think that as far as, like, the attacking teams, I, I agree, especially early on, I think attacking teams are probably going to benefit a lot of defense characters. Part of their kit is knowing the map and knowing the best places to, like, put down a Torb turret or best places to set up his Bastion. So that's certainly going to be just a matter of time. But also, this early on, when you're playing it on the PTR, people probably aren't taking it quite as seriously with their... Uh, uh, team comps and things like that also so i'm not surprised to hear that the uh the experience has leaned towards the attacking side oh yeah my first match on eichenwald we didn't have a healer um the only one who could do any healing was our soldier 76 so um that's something that um you know is to be expected i don't really put it on anyone to uh, play competitively or choose the best team comp when you're doing ptr because a lot of the times people are jumping in to try out uh, characters that may be rebalanced or um, kind of test a certain character that is a favorite of theirs on a new map, anything like that. So that being said, it'll be interesting to see where it goes uh, once it is actually officially released, which I'm um, being told is uh, sometime in early September. So, yeah, I mean, it's regardless, even with teams that um, weren't necessarily the most efficient, it was a whole lot of fun to play. That drawbridge right before you get into the castle, I've noticed was a particularly awesome spot. There seemed to be a lot of chaos. It's easy to fall off. Great defensive posts, great ways to attack and uh, start throwing ults in. So yeah, it's going to be a whole lot of fun and I can't wait to see um, once it's released uh, what the community does with it, uh, certain aspects of the map that maybe people take advantage of, stop complaining about, or just you know the epic battles that are going to happen in a literal medieval castle. It's the greatest. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait for that to go live. Uh, so speaking of the PTR, though, I, I had a funny thing happen, and uh, it kind of relates to what you're talking about. Uh, I, I jumped on just to try out Hanzo, and uh, my first impression was, wow, he, he feels a lot faster, a lot crisper. I expect to see him picked a lot more now, and uh, it won't be an instant eye roll when someone else picks him. He's a, he's a real character now. But... Um, I had a funny thing happen. I joined uh, on the PTR, mind you, so just trying out Hanzo. I go into a competitive match to see if I happen to roll across any of the format changes for Season 2. And uh, and I got on a team that, that thought it was like Game 7 of the World Series. I mean, they were taking it really, really seriously to the point where they wanted me to switch off Hanzo, and May, my own May was walling me into the spawn room to try and get me to switch off Hanzo. Oh, my God. <laughs> People, it's the PTR. <laughs> Calm down. Yeah, um, you know, that's probably a byproduct of maybe a lot of people leaving competitive mode. We tend to get stuck in that 
oh my god, I have to win everything. All right, we need a healer, we need a tank, and it's like, calm down, people. It's a PTR, like Jeff said. We're here to have fun. We're here to try out new stuff and to literally wall in your own teammate because you don't want to lose. It's not even stats that you're going to keep. Your PTR stats or loot boxes or anything that you gain are not carried over back to the main game. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. You know, if you want to win, you want to win. But if if it's that important to you, wait till it's actually released and just have fun with it, I say. But, um, yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. Going back to your point on Hanzo, yeah, I feel um, everybody that – or at least Hanzo fans seem to be pretty happy with the uh, buffs that he has. Just as a quick review, uh, what they did with Hanzo is they increased his projectile speed and they increased his movement speed while you're drawing back the bow before it used to slow you down quite a bit. Now it is uh, noticeably faster. I played as him as well. And uh, I don't consider myself a great Hanzo player, but I will say I was just nailing headshot after headshot. That being said, and uh, I'm not sure if you had heard of this, Jeff, but uh, just recently, and by recently I mean like an hour ago, they made an announcement that they just rebalanced the PTR and they actually um, rebalanced Hanzo a little bit. They felt as good as he was, he was maybe a little too good, which we've heard again in the past. And um, apparently what they did is they dropped down the projectile size so uh the arrow which a lot of people in the community have been jokingly calling logs you know giant arrows where they don't visually look big but they just seem to hit even if they're nowhere near you they actually did go forward and drop down the size of the projectile so uh, the hitbox on the actual projectile is going to be a little less and they did that to kind of balance out hans a little bit um with his increased projectile speed and his movement speed so we'll kind of see how that goes but um i thought that was kind of interesting and it just shows blizzard you know right after releasing a ptr a few days later already rebalancing it so they're obviously very active on this character balancing did there happen to be any uh genji redemption in this new rebalancing uh no no they uh they did <laughs> they did increase the effectiveness of uh soldier 76 burst fire as well but uh no no mention of genji unfortunately for yeah you. no I, I did hear about that uh slight changes that they made earlier and uh i I think that's probably a good thing as far as hanzo is concerned i could definitely see where people were saying that he felt too strong and i think it's part of that is his mechanics which are again getting a little bit crisper but just in general i mean i i guess you could almost relate it to roadhog's hook where you want it to feel consistent or else it's going to feel unfair to people so you know (laughs) When you see a play of the game with Hanzo and he like, it, I mean, the arrow wasn't even close and he's just headshotting people left and right, that's a problem. And people are going to go back and watch that play of the game and everyone's going to feel cheated. So it's a good thing for it to, you know, behave how it looks like it should behave, I think. Uh, and I heard about the soldier change as well. They they say that's a buff. I'm interested to, to get hands on with that and see how that really feels. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, just to kind of go back to last week a little bit i'm uh i'm still a little bit upset about genji but i'm getting over it i don't agree with the uh the loss of the triple jump after the wall climb i think it it, i equate it to tracer losing her third blink and i'm not i'm not lying or exact (laughs) i don't feel like i'm exaggerating at all no i know Uh, you're not but uh i mean the rest of the stuff i can live with whatever so i'll move on i'll just pick hanzo more and genji less oh my goodness yeah, it is what it is. We'll we'll see how it kind of affects the uh, balance of the game. But so far, no uh, news of them changing anything in that regard. So we'll see how it flows. To switch gears a little bit, there's a whole lot. I know the past few episodes, we've been kind of keeping tabs on the uh, Sombra ARG, the alternate reality game of Blizzard, basically uh, through their own website and in the game and various social media. They've been uh, dropping hints about Sombra, kind of taking taking it as the character herself is actually hacking into a lot of this media and uh, giving the Overwatch players hints about her existence and what's going on and uh our community has been absolutely on point being the uh they're calling them the sombra detectives a lot of people on reddit 
have been looking into uh, the hints she's been dropping. And um, as of this recording, she has recently dropped a whole lot of hints. Uh, it's been pretty exciting, and it's a, I think it's a really, really cool way to see this character kind of slowly being introduced into the Overwatch cast, which is, uh, seems imminent at this point. Yeah, I hope they just get down to business pretty soon, though. I mean, it's been pretty exciting to follow when it didn't feel imminent, but now that we're looking at actual, like, 24-hour countdowns and stuff, uh, just get on with it. (laughs) I mean, you know, (laughs) before it was like, oh, yeah, this is something to look at for a few weeks, and now it's like you constantly need to refresh on, on Twitter or on Reddit to try and keep up with whatever happened in the last 20 minutes. It's a lot of uh, energy, so I hope it's not going to go on this way for another week or so. But, no, um, man, that's how they keep you interested. you got to constantly check their social media. Come on, you know this is on purpose. Well, I know, I know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too bogged down into the details of exactly what they're doing because it will definitely change by the time uh, we get around to next week and, and the week after. So uh, just in general, uh, do you have any thoughts yet on exactly what Sombra is up to? I, I'm sure there's some sort of uh, plot to this whole mechanism. Well, yeah, um, like you said, we could definitely talk about this all day, so I won't go deep into it. But uh, just as kind of a summary, basically, um, on the Blizzard forums, uh, Sombra put a post up that when you viewed the post, it went all glitchy and crazy. And then there was a series of numbers and text and everything that popped up. So, of course, the Overwatch community goes right to it to solve the mystery of what Sombra is doing. And essentially, um, a whole bunch of information came from this. And to kind of rush through it here, the blog post turned into a series of numbers. The series of numbers was eventually decoded and uh, found to be a, another skull. It actually made a art out of the text and numbers into a skull. People took this skull, they decoded that, turned out to be a file name that ended up being a video. The video ended up being a x-ray of uh, someone's skull with an eye injury. Obviously, it was Anna. People looked into that. They were looking at the uh, heart rate monitor at the bottom of the video. That ended up turning into letters because there were 26 points on the heart rate monitor. So they related it to letters. The letters translated to a moment in crime. That's the actual sentence it converted to, which ended up being a website and email. People emailed this address, and then there ended up being a somber message Uh, response in the address which was another code and it just kept on going and going and she's basically just leading the entire community deeper into the rabbit hole um, with the constant theme of information is power and um, yeah essentially it's Seems to me at this point that Sombra is a hacker (laughs) and she's she's very cryptic. So um, how that relates to the game, I'm actually quite interested because when you look at that, it seems to me that Sombra might be – I don't know – She might be another support character, but that seems unlikely with the recent introduction of Anna. Um, A really, really interesting aspect that she – a message that she sent the community through one of these crazy deciphered codes was uh, something to the effect of, oh, you – you think these people are heroes. What if I told you a little something about them that you didn't know? So it's uh, she seems to have information in the scoop on, if not one, uh, multiple Overwatch heroes and is not a big fan of them. So we don't know who she's aligned with, uh, presumably Reaper, but uh, she's definitely not on the side of the quote-unquote good guys. And uh, she is slowly releasing information and, man, just really messing with everybody. So that being said, man, I don't even know how she'd play in the game but it looks like it might be information based it might be something where she can use people's weaknesses against them i mean you can speculate for hours on this but you're not offering any actual speculation jam like for example the uh we, okay so just a little <laughs> backstory uh jam and i've been spinning off the rails about game of thrones theories for years so uh this is oh fun God. stuff We're doing but this? uh yeah i mean i'm talking like <laughs> Is Sombra uploading an Order 66 to all the Omnics? I mean, are we rebooting the Omnic War here? What's she uploading right now? Because it's at like 4% on this website. 
as of this recording. Yeah, um, she's going to be doing that, and she's a Targaryen. She'll be riding an ice dragon. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> why, why is Mercy not aged? It's a real question now. <laughs> that, no, Genetic and that's testing a legitimate jam. question, because um, a bunch of the Overwatch founding members have definitely aged. Uh, Jack Morrison, Soldier 76, and then obviously Reinhardt. But Mercy, she uh, there's actually a voice line, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard, between her and May, where uh, she says, May, you look as good as you ever did, because May was under uh, cryogenic freezing. And um, she responds, and so do you. <laughs> so we know May's reason, but why does Mercy look the same age? So I get where you're coming from, but I don't want to be quick to jump to conclusions in these crazy theories because we don't know. We don't really know what the information is. And I kind of like to take the approach of work with the information you have and not just all of a sudden jump to these ridiculous conclusions. Oh, but see, I've got this mat with different <laughs> conclusions on it. That you can jump to. Uh, <laughs> how, no, many, I'm, I'm how many of to our listeners understand that reference? This is getting this is getting off the rails. <laughs> Everyone's seen Office Space. All right. So yeah, Sombra is obviously screwing with us, and she's going to be a really interesting character. Um, everybody seemed to think that she was going to be released on August 23rd, being the 23rd character, and uh, apparently her gamer tag name on the Blizzard post was binary for 23, but um, it is at the point of this recording past the 23rd, so that's obviously not the case. Now people are thinking it might be uh, sometime in October, maybe Day of the Dead, because she is um, speaking in Spanish. There's a lot of skulls involved, uh, for those who aren't familiar. Day of the Dead is the day after Halloween, and uh, in Mexico it's celebrated, and it's generally celebrated with decorations of skulls and things like that. So um, there's, there, there's a lot of theories here. Um, I'd hate to wait till the end of October for a somber release, hoping it would be a little earlier than that. But um, I guess it just remains to be seen, so speculate away. So uh, what we're going to get into this episode is a little different from what we've done in the past. Uh, we've been doing a lot of character breakdowns and everything, but um, we're actually, this is going to be our very first map breakdown. The purpose of this is to kind of go through every single map in Overwatch in detail and uh, not only offer a little bit of lore and Easter eggs and information on the map, but also uh, strategic advice, maybe certain places you might not be aware of because uh, what Jeff and I have noticed, even with ourselves, is that we tend to jump into maps and follow the same path over and over again, and uh, depending on what character you main or you play regularly or few characters, there might be areas in the map that you tend to stick to and other areas of the map that you might not be familiar with at all. So we're doing these in-depth map breakdowns for each map to kind of really get into it, into the details, and uh, hopefully by listening to this, you guys will learn something that maybe you didn't know about the map. And the map that we're going to start with is Route 66. So Route 66 is a uh, is a wonderful map. It is a actual location in the United States. Just a little history on this. Uh, Route 66 is a U.S. highway that was established in 1926 and then uh, later decommissioned in 1985. It was a highway that went from Santa Monica, California to Chicago, Illinois. So it traveled right through the southwest portion of the United States and is generally related to the Southwestern culture, um, that kind of early cowboy desert feel, a really, really cool location. And in the lore of Overwatch, it was actually a road that was kind of abandoned and eventually with the invention of uh, transcontinental hypertrains, most people stopped using the route entirely. So it was abandoned to sort of your outlaws and your... Uh, scum of the earth and people that were more involved in illicit weapons trafficking and other illegal things. So that's what Route 66 is in Overwatch. It's a hideout for the Deadlock Gang, which is a uh, gang of criminals that work together to uh, steal and plunder and run heists. 
And we see a lot of that currently in Overwatch. So Route 66 itself is a payload map. This is one of the maps where you have to push a payload from one point to another. There's an attack side and a defense side. And uh, there's multiple sections of the map. So what we're going to do, for uh, at least for the payload maps, is we're going to break it down into sections. And each of these sections are going to be divided by the checkpoints that you reach. So Route 66 has two checkpoints. So that would give it three sections, section one, two, and three. And uh, what we'll do is we'll run through each of those sections and we'll talk about some of the different areas in it, areas that might be good for sniping, for turrets, for flanking. And uh, we'll just kind of move on both attack and defense. Yeah, Route 66 is actually uh, probably my first favorite map. I really love this one. I, I love in general how unique all the maps in the game feel. I mean, there aren't really two that are similar, I don't think. But this one is definitely, yeah, like your typical like Old West uh, cowboy feel. A lot of the landscape out in the distance definitely reminds me of Thousand Needles from WoW. I also love how many details are scattered around uh, in all the maps, but especially in this one. There's a lot of posters on the wall. Uh, there's a lot of things if you actually take time to look. I mean, even like right at the attacking spawn, there's the little maps of uh, how they were going to blow out the bridge that the train has collapsed from. So... They do a good job of giving some context to why the map is the way it is. In general, I really like characters that can take advantage of the space and the long sight lines. This is a very large map and pretty linear, I think. So characters like Farah do a really good job. There's there's no ceiling, really. I mean, you can get up really high with her. I've had a lot of success with D.Va also. And I think Tracer does a good job of uh, closing the distance pretty quickly. Anna also, or, or Widowmaker, characters like that that can take advantage of the long sight lines do pretty well here. Yeah, I'm glad you actually brought up the long sight lines and the size of the map, because the map for the first two sections is actually an open air map. So uh, the entire of this map is located in Deadlock Gorge, which is basically the Grand Canyon. If you look at the outsides of the map, it's huge. It's just in this giant, cool-looking western canyon. And the whole point of the map is to push the payload, which is a U.S. military bomb that the Deadlock gang uh, stole from this train that they basically blew up the track, made, made it go off rails to steal this military equipment. So when you're on attack, you're pushing the U.S. military bomb on the payload to uh, the hideout of the Deadlock gang. And on defense, you're obviously trying to stop them from getting the bomb to the hideout. But um, yeah, that being said, the payload actually follows... Uh, the main route on the road. However, um, it moves through this canyon and there's just so many different areas on the sides of the canyon, on the main road, and then a bunch of the buildings right off the main road for you to flank from, snipe from. It's really, really cool. Um, As far as characters go, weirdly enough for me on both attack and defense, I really, really enjoy playing May on this map. The reason being because you can kind of pop in from the side. Uh, there's a lot of second level areas on both the buildings and on the canyon as well, where you can kind of drop down, freeze people. You can use the wall, the ice wall, to get yourself up to the second level fairly easily. Um, there's not a whole lot of vertical difference, so uh, the wall is usually good enough to get you to the second level of almost anywhere on the map. And uh, I love using her up also, Diva, particularly on attack, it's really nice to kind of fly around, get to people up in their vantage points and uh, uh, knocking snipers away and uh, holding up your shield for your team and really centering around the payload, but also being super mobile. So it's a whole lot of fun and it's uh, it leaves for a lot of options with different characters to really have fun with it, test out your abilities and uh, set traps in certain areas. So let's go ahead and talk about the first section of Route 66. We're going to call this Section 1. Uh, section 1 is uh, what uh, I like to call the Panoramic Diner, the Train Wreckage, and Big Earl's Gas Station. So um, a lot of the times when you're running through these payload maps, you're not really paying attention to the details because you're worried about not dying and killing your opponents. But I feel that if we break it down into what these locations actually are, people will definitely be able to relate. So when you're on attack, the first section that you're in is that is your spawn point is the panoramic diner. Uh, this diner is super cool because it has it's just loaded with a bunch of details. 
Um, it has cool posters all over the walls. It really feels, if you live in the United States and you've been to diners like this, then you're very familiar with the idea of a diner with a whole bunch of stuff on the walls and just a lot of personality. So, um... Right off the bat, we're getting slammed with all this cool media. Um, there's a lot of Easter eggs hidden throughout the diner. There's uh, an advertisement for uh, Diablo hot sauce, which is an obvious reference to the Diablo game from Blizzard. There's comic books on a few of the desks. Uh, the comic book is actually called Craft of the Stars, Starcraft. So once again, another Blizzard game. And uh, there's just all sorts of cool details. More to the story of Overwatch and to the story of the map, you can actually find, as Jeff mentioned before, plans to blow up the bridge. You see the actual um, bombing plans. You can see the plans to actually steal the payload and uh, everything on top of that. So the Panoramic Diner is actually where the Deadlock Gang kind of has their base of operations for blowing up the train. Once you walk outside of the diner, then you see this expansive level, huge area. You look up and there's a uh, destroyed train track with uh, train wreckage all over the place. And it's a great way to just jump in and immediately get to the payload that's just a little bit past the train wreckage, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, my first thought, when you first come out of the attack spawn, you just feel like you walked into a war zone because there's a burning train right in front of you. And don't bother trying, you can't actually get up to the tracks. No, you cannot. <laughs> At least I haven't found a character that can. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a wasted effort. But, uh, yeah, I think the key to this first section, like everything up to the first checkpoint, the, the key to the whole thing really is the gas station, in my opinion. Uh, in terms of strategy, it's a really important spot, and it's a spot that a lot of teams miss, I think, because uh, everyone likes to crowd onto the payload at the beginning. But the gas station is great as far as sight lines, so be aware of that. And, and also along the cliff, there's a, a cliff to the right when you come out of the attacking spawn where there's a like a flanking path that runs around that is prime real estate for environmental kills. So that's another reason that I like to play a character like Farah or Diva on a map like this, because there's a lot of opportunity for environmental kills, and there's not a whole lot anyone can do if they're that close to the edge and you knock them off. Uh, it's pretty easy pickings from there. But yeah, as the attacking team, you should hope that the uh, opponents have pushed as far up as possible, I think. Uh, it'll give you the best chance to wipe out the defending team and then push the payload to the gas station before they can get back from spawn. <laughs> I think that's the easiest way because otherwise uh, pushing the payload around the first corner can be pretty difficult if the defense is set up. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. I think that um, when I've played on defense, uh, the most success I've had is actually waiting around the corner. So when you have the train wreckage and then you're moving as the attacking team, you're moving forward and then you take a left and you have the gas station to your right. That corner is generally where I like to kind of hang with my team. And once the payload comes around the corner, then you have plenty of opportunities both on top of the gas station, on the cliff side, from afar. If you're a sniper, you can go on the cliff side or at ground level. There's a lot of areas in which you can hit the attacking team when you're on defense. So I think that's weirdly a, uh, a choke point for this map um, is with that first left turn around uh, going towards uh, Big Earl's gas station, as they call it. And uh, the cool thing about the gas station is it's really interesting because not only is it multi-level, but there actually is a health pack on the first floor in there. So people that are familiar with this map will usually hang around there and uh, be aware of that. If they're not getting heals, they can run to that health pack and uh, kind of use the indoor area as cover. And also the secondary floor is a prime location uh, for a bastion or a turret as well. Yeah, uh, from a defending standpoint, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the second floor, the roof of the gas station... That one corner, uh, especially the nearest corner to uh, the attacking spawn, is ideal for like a Torbjorn turret uh, because it's going to be able to cover the main street where the payload is going to come in, but also both tunnels through the wall to its right and then the uh, the flank along the cliff that I mentioned before to it, to the left. So there's really no way that anyone can get through without that turret at least making the beep sound to try and pick up a target. Um, it's a good way to make sure that uh, you're, it's essentially calling out for you if you're getting flanked. 
and you'll also see a lot of times if you uh, have like a Bastion and Reinhardt working together, they'll set up up there. It's really tough to push that if the defending team is set up on that corner. One other thing about attack on, on this first section, uh, this is a character-specific thing, but it's a trick that I learned, and I do it pretty often now because it's really effective. So the defending team, as I mentioned before, will often just pile onto the payload right at the beginning. Uh, the tanks will be up there, and then they'll usually have like their snipers or their turret characters a little bit further back on that wooden overpass. So I like to play Farah on attack, and right at the beginning, just go right out the uh, the rightmost exit, jump off the cliff, and hover around below line of sight, like below the edge of the cliff. You can actually hover a good bit around the edge and then concussion blast yourself to go even further, then use her flight, and you end up uh, flying up in the air directly to the side or behind the turrets and the, the Widowmaker or whoever set up on that wooden platform. So... I use this trick pretty often. I think Fair is the only character that can really get around and do it because of the hover. But it's a really good way to get all the way behind the defending team and they never really saw you. Uh, I've used this trick pretty often. It's pretty effective. Yeah, that's actually a great tip because I feel um, when you're playing on defense on that map and uh, as you mentioned before, uh, a lot of teams do like to kind of push right up to the payload, which can be effective if your team is, you know, communicating and making sure everything's good. But uh, the problem with that is if you do push too far forward, it's very easy to get behind them using that strategy and then just start launching rockets and <laughs> taking out their sniper. And their, uh, generally the healers like Lucio or Mercy will stay in the back. So um, as an attack character, generally your first thing you want to do is take out their support characters. So uh, that's a really good attack strategy. On the flip side, if you're on defense, uh, one of the things I love to do uh, playing as May, for example, is I love to stay on that cliff side. If you're on attack, it's right on the left, the far left side where the train wreckage, you can kind of walk through the train and walk up to the cliff. Um, I love to kind of hang there. I get to, you have a really good viewpoint of the entire area. So you can kind of see if people are trying to flank, if they're trying to sneak by, you can keep an eye on them. If they're trying to come up through the train, um, the train is a great way if you're on attack to uh, avoid being seen and then come up and start flanking as an attacker as well. So I like to kind of stay on more that side of the map. It also reduces the amount of environmental kills that might happen to me. Like you said, uh, characters like Farah, uh, Diva, even Junkrat with his concussive mine um, can easily knock you off. And uh, one of the things about Route 66, especially on defense, is uh, if you're trying to protect that uh, first section and uh, the first checkpoint from getting captured, it is quite a walk back after you get killed. So getting killed is a huge disadvantage, especially if you're a character with little mobility like Mei or Zarya uh, who can't get back quickly. Um, you're going to be spending a good amount of your time coming back. And if you're a healer like Mercy, who has no mobility outside of being able to track onto some of your other teammates, it is terrible because then all you see are those critical icons in the distance fading away and you can't do anything about it. So, um, you know, it is possible to stop somebody right at the payload, but I feel uh, your team has a lot more cover around the gas station and uh, that's generally a really, really good area to uh, keep everyone alive and uh, it's a great choke point for the map. Yeah, that's a really good point about the run back. It does feel a little bit longer than some other situations and some other maps. So that's kind of why I think the gas station is, is such a good spot for the defending team, because you're essentially choosing one spot to make your stand in Section 1. Uh, if you're on the payload and you get wiped out, you can probably, I mean, you can make it back before they get uh, before the attacking team pushes the payload to the first checkpoint, but you won't be able to make it back and set up another defense, and you won't probably be grouped up very well because you're all running back individually as you died. So usually it doesn't hold for long if you are able to stop the payload a second time. So uh, just be aware of that. I, I think it's really more about picking your spots, and that's why I like the gas station so much for that. Um, one other thing I want to mention, uh, as a defending team, in Section 1, the small tunnels that go through the wall, there's actually two, one on the lower level and, and one uh, higher up leading from the, uh, the train tunnel that you talked about before. Uh, those tunnels can be fantastic spots for Symmetra to set a trap. Uh, they're pretty enclosed areas, and you can usually uh, hide her turrets 
in a pretty effective way so that people won't know that what they're walking into until they're getting hit by all six of them. And then further back from that is, uh, is a really good spot for Symmetra to set up, set up her teleporter. It's hard to get a, a good sight line on it without coming all the way around the corner. And if your team is defending the gas station, you're kind of stopping them from getting around that corner. So just be aware of that. Uh, I don't always recommend Symmetra on payloads. But for this particular spot, if you're kind of choosing to hold, it's almost like a, like a point defense. Yeah, I completely agree. And those uh, symmetric teleporters, I think it's very important to uh, pick areas of the map that aren't uh, widely used. Even though the tunnels are used, a lot of the areas just slightly past it, you know, people start focusing right back on the main road that the payload goes on. So you want to make sure that you're dropping your teleporters in areas that people generally don't explore and um, dropping your turrets in areas where people try to flank. Because if they do, you'll kind of have an idea that they're coming. Symmetra does get a warning when turrets are destroyed. Anybody getting attacked by a turret immediately, you know, if they're a good player, they're going to try to break them. So that's already... Uh, a warning sign. Yeah, your turrets are destroyed, but you know somebody's in there and you can communicate that with your team. So uh, that's really important. Uh, once you get past the gas station a little bit, uh, we're kind of, kind of coming to the end of section one, which is uh, the very end of the gas station before you get to the big iron gate. So this area I've noticed is generally a choke point as well uh, because there's actually a lot of cover towards the rear of the gas station. Um, there's inside the gas station. There's on top of it. Um, you can break line of sight. Oh, on the cliff side specifically, was, there's the big uh, billboard of Panoramic Diner, which is the spawn point. Um, you can kind of walk along that cliffside and hide behind multiple rocks and the billboard itself to kind of come in. So for both attack and a d defense, this is a very, very chaotic area of the map. Yeah, that's true. You definitely do see uh, some, some crazy uh, chaotic engagements right before the checkpoint. Uh, and again, I think that's also um, kind of a result of the defending team maybe having been wiped out and all running back and maybe they got enough shots off early to have a few ults when they get back. So... Yeah, it's kind of their last stand to stop the checkpoint, and so you'll often see ults going off there and people dropping down off the rooftop, and uh, it can get a little bit, bit crazy right before the checkpoint, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's say that this checkpoint now has been reached by the attacking team. So uh, what you had before is your spawn point for the attack was the panoramic diner, and your spawn point for the defense was actually the propane shop. Once you hit the first checkpoint... Uh, both of these change. So now you hit the first checkpoint. The attacking group has the, the Cave of Mystery, uh, which is pretty cool. It's right behind the gas station, a little bit uh, farther to the right and back. This is going to be the new spawn point for the attacking team. Uh, the cool thing about this is the Cave of Mystery, just a little lower, going back into that. It's actually a tourist trap. In the world of Overwatch, people come to Route 66 and they visit the Cave of Mystery. And it's thought that aliens are in that cave and, are, you know, are there aliens? And if you go in there, there's actually like a shop with merchandise and aliens that are actually related to a movie that was directed by the director... Uh, something Glitchbot, I forget his name, but he's actually the director that is in the payload for Hollywood. So the director that you are... Escorting in Hollywood is the director of this movie that the Cave of Mystery is basing its whole idea off of. So cool little Easter egg there. But um, that's going to be the spawn point. So now you're pushed up a little further. Now you're basically right in front of the first checkpoint for a spawn point on attack. When you're on defense, your first spawn point is the propane shop, which is right next to the garage and behind the saloon so you kind of come out of the cliffside on the first level and you can you have to like we said before run this ridiculously long distance all the way down past the iron gates all the way to the diner area but now if you have lost the first checkpoint uh, you are going to have your spawn point and your spawn point will remain um, all the way in the deadlock hideout so it's in the cave it's at the very very other end of the map so still a long way to walk but um, not too bad depending on where the action is and uh, 
um, the giant iron gates open, and all of a sudden, the game switches the feel of the map because you are in this long road surrounded by buildings with uh, flanking positions. And there is uh, seemingly even more places to hide, to snipe from. And uh, both on attack and defense, things get a lot more interesting. Yeah, Section 2 is interesting. I I think the defending team still has a pretty long run back. But I'd say, in general, the key to this section, or the key figure in in Section 2, between the first and second checkpoint, is probably the saloon. It's the large building right in the center that the payload kind of winds around, and it's a two-level building. So you'll often see people trying to hide in there or flank through it or around it uh, from both the attacking and defending team. There's a cliff behind the garage straight ahead of the payload when you first come through. Be aware of that. Uh, it's another cliff that can be used for environmental kills. Yeah, and on that note, let me just give, go ahead and give names to these areas. Uh, when you first, as the attacking team, come in to Section 2 and you hit the first checkpoint, um, the first building immediately to your left is the Cave Inn which is, you know, a funny pun, but it's actually um, like a motel-type area that's broken down. Um, There's a health pack immediately in that area. Immediately after that, the next building is the high side, which is the saloon that Jeff is talking about. Um, This is a two-level bar that you can go both on the first floor and on the second floor. There's great areas for cover, and you can actually get on the roof as well. On the very, very far end is Zed's Garage, and this is the area where there's also a health pack. Right behind the garage is the cliff that Jeff's talking about. And then uh, as you come around the left corner, on your right side, kind of built into the cliff side, is the Deadlock Propane, which is the propane store that is uh, the spawn point for the defending team. So these are kind of the areas that you're going to be playing around in on there. There's a lot of cliffs and areas like that where you can um, hide, get good vantage points, uh, get cover, and it makes the fight a lot more interesting. Yeah, so uh, just kind of starting off as the attacking team for this section, I think uh, the tunnel that actually leads away from the first checkpoint is a great way to uh, get into Section 2. So if you're looking right at the first checkpoint, all the way to the right is a tunnel that will flank around, and it's really the the best way for the attacking team to get around into Section 2. And it comes out kind of in the middle or behind by the garage. If you don't use that, then for the most part, your whole team is just kind of walking up the street with the payload, so it can leave you vulnerable. That tunnel actually goes across the roof of the garage and leads to a walkway that runs along the entire far side of the cliff all the way to the second checkpoint. Uh, That's also kind of a a walkway that the defending team will be coming back from usually. More often than not, that's how they're going to run back to the fight. So be aware of that as you're pushing the payload forward that you're going to see a lot of people running out of that tunnel onto that second level walkway. And another thing, uh, the, the garage that we mentioned, there's a large health pack in there. And that's a great place to take cover. It's also the home of my favorite Easter egg for this map, which is the poster that says Overwhelming Power on the wall, which is a callback to the StarCraft God Mode sheet, which would type in Power Overwhelming and You Are Invincible. So I thought that was that was pretty <laughs> funny. Um, See, I had no idea what that was, so I would have walked right by that and no idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like that one a little bit because it's... Uh, there's a little bit more depth to it than just calling something Diablo hot sauce. Everyone's heard of Diablo, even if you didn't play it. But that one, I felt like that one was just for me. But, uh, yeah, in general, I feel like the attacking team does pretty well in this section because I think the defending team has a long run back. But as the defending team, I think your best bet for holding in this section is right when the payload emerges from checkpoint one in the tunnel. Uh, from there, like I said, there's really only one flank around So a lot of times the team will be kind of penned in around the payload. Uh, You can attack it from uh, the saloon side and kind of drop down on them from a second level. And there are some long sight lines for snipers kind of set up with like a walkway overpass further up the road. So uh, the entire defending team can kind of set up to their strength and engage right when the payload's coming out of the checkpoint one tunnel. I think that's kind of your best bet there. The only other thing, uh, as far as uh, defending... On Section 2, I love D.Va for this. Specifically, I've had a ridiculous amount of success launching her ultimate off the saloon rooftop. As the payload approaches the rooftop, it's actually it's a rooftop that kind of covers a line of sight. There's not like an edge that you could stand on and shoot down on people from there. And so because of that, 
I don't think a lot of attacking teams ever really pay attention to it because if a defender can't be set up shooting at you, why bother? Um, but because of that, I think that Diva's ult can be pretty effective and can catch people by surprise because you launch it over this rooftop and they don't see it coming and it just comes down right on the payload. Yeah, that's actually a great strategy because the funny thing about that section of the map is that it's very open. Unless you're inside of the high side uh, saloon, there's really not a whole lot of cover. It's a pretty open area. So uh, throwing out a ult like a Diva's self-destruct or even a rip tire from Junkrat is going to be super effective in that area. As the attacking side, you, of course, want to stay near the payload. And uh, if there's not a whole lot of areas to take cover in, then you're going to get a lot of kills in that area. That being said, I will say on the flip side that the towards the end of the Section 2, as you're approaching the second gate and the second checkpoint... If you're kind of in that area next to the propane shop, in between the propane shop and the high side saloon, then um, I've seen a lot of uh, teams start getting into a choke point there as well. Just because there is a myriad of options as far as being on the second level, first level, you know, maybe sniping from a distance uh, all the way back from the initial gate as the attacking side, or even popping a bastion on the second floor of the high side as well and just shooting down at people. Um, There are a whole lot of areas to really defend in this area. So that second checkpoint really becomes an area of bloodshed and a whole lot of combat in which you can both attack effectively and defend effectively. And, of course, as you're getting closer to the end of the map, um, you're getting closer to the spawn point of the defensive team. So they can get back fairly quickly and start defending that second checkpoint. So I see a lot of matches end in this area as well. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic about payload maps that you don't always think about right off the bat. But uh, because the payload is essentially the point that everyone wants to fight on top of and it's moving... Whichever team has the advantage throughout the fight is kind of changing as the payload moves. So uh, definitely as you're beginning Section 2, I'd say the attacking team has a a large advantage in terms of their run back to the payload. But uh, as you push further and further, it becomes harder because the defending team is spawning closer and closer. And that's definitely kind of coming to a head as we get into Section 3 here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you're defending that second checkpoint, I do want to mention, if you look directly behind the high side saloon on the second floor, so there's this kind of area in between the saloon and the cave in that's almost never touched. If anything, it's used to, as the defensive side, to get to checkpoint one quicker. But there is actually an area all the way towards the rear where you can kind of hide and basically get a great vantage point, say, as a sniper or as Farah or even as a bastion. And you have full sight of the second checkpoint. And a lot of people don't look up there right up and to the left, I think, is a great place to really put up your defense and start mowing down the attacking team. So keep that in mind. It's right on the second floor behind the high side saloon. But let's say the attacking team gets past that, it hits checkpoint two. Well, now we're in the final stretch. We are in the deadlock hideout. And once you get in the deadlock hideout, things change completely. And I will say, even on the matches where the defensive team gets mowed down easily from checkpoint one to checkpoint two, the second you get to the hideout, Maybe, I'd even say 90% of the time, things change completely on this final third section of the map. Yeah, this last stretch here is uh, very different than the rest of the map, and I agree with you. I've seen oftentimes where the attacking team will be pushing easily, pushing easily, and then they get to this last section, and they just get stopped and held the whole time. So it's a totally different dynamic. It's very enclosed. And because of that, I, I actually think a character like Farah, who I love for the first two-thirds of the map, struggles a little bit in here. I mean, she can still fly up to the ceiling, but there is a ceiling. So most of the time, if I'm playing Farah, I'll swap off of her as soon as I die and we're in, and we're in the last section, uh, unless I have an ult to use. I think this section probably favors more characters like Reaper or Roadhog. I've seen Junkrat do pretty well because there's a lot of things to bounce grenades off of. 
Tracer also, because there's a lot of flanks in uh, a long stretch here at the end. And another character that I wouldn't have thought right off the bat, but um, because of the actual path the payload takes, there's a it's a really narrow pathway uh, right as it opens up into the last room. And uh, a character like Anna can do really well there because both teams will be kind of fighting in what what is essentially just a one character wide spot to each side of the payload. And so you just kind of keep firing. It doesn't really matter who you hit. You're either hurting the enemies or helping your allies. So I've felt pretty effective in spots like that with Anna. No, it's funny that you say that because I feel like um, not only Anna, but almost all the snipers, I feel that uh, Widowmaker, Anna, and Hanzo in that final section of Route 66, it's a long hallway. It's darker. It's more enclosed. So you really, really are susceptible to some sniper fire from the defensive end particularly. Uh, But even as an attacker, if uh, for whatever reason you want to play a sniper on attack, then uh, you can... A lot of the defensive side seems to just stand right in the final area where you're supposed to drop the payload without any cover, and they just start shooting at you. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess that's going to be uh, open shots for me. And th- I'm not. I'm talking like three to four characters will just be standing with no cover. It's really amazing. So it's a uh, it's an interesting area of the map because the fight completely changes. I feel that you do see a lot of character swaps in that area. At that point, the spawn point does change for the attacking team, but not for the defending team. The defending team still is in the far end of uh, right, kind of right behind the payload is where they spawn. So it's very easy and quick to get to the payload, which kind of adds to the chaotic aspect of the game. And then the attacking team switches from the cave of mystery to the cave in. So the, um, the cave in, as we said, is the first building to your left when you pass the first checkpoint. That becomes your spawn point. So now you can run right, uh, maybe about, I'd say 20 meters, you run forward and then you're right in the deadlock hideout. So the interesting thing about the deadlock hideout is that it has um, a whole lot of flanking points, but unlike the first two sections of the map, it's a lot narrower. So um, on the left side, you actually have the storage area and the office, and uh, the, it's also multi-level, so you can get to go on the first floor or the second floor. Um, There's health packs both on the uh, far end of the storage area and in the office itself. And then you can also get onto the second floor as well. And uh, then you're going to notice a very, very important part of this section of the map, and that is the floating platforms. Um, There are multiple floating platforms that kind of follow a track, and uh, they are floating on the second level of this section of the map. And uh, this is really, really important for this map because you will see constantly uh, Torbjorn dropping his turrets on these platforms. You'll see a bastion on them, and they kind of rotate on the, if you're the attacking team, the left side of the map. And uh, you'd be surprised how many teams are just mowed down by somebody on these platforms and nobody's taking it out either the turret or the sniper that's hanging on them. So that's very important to note. On the right side, it's a little less visited, weirdly enough. It's the weapon storage. There is a second level where you can kind of you know, shoot down on people and snipe them as well. But you can also jump in there, grab some health pack, and also take some cover. And it's an interesting part of the map because on both levels you have a lot of cover. Uh, you have a lot of flanking areas. So for both attack and defense, you really, really get to hone in on the payload area. And uh, it just turns crazy chaotic, especially considering both attack and defense. More so defense with their spawn point, but even on attack, it doesn't take too long to get back to that section of the map. Yeah, that's a good point about the uh, right side, I guess, if you're the attacking team. I don't see a lot of flankers going that direction. It's usually more uh, preferring the left-hand side with the conveyor platforms, which, I mean, the platforms themselves can be very, very useful as an attacking flanker to get all the way back to the defending team spawn without making any footsteps or, or making a lot of noise. But you also see the defending team use it where they'll <laughs> have a a ballsy McCree that'll jump up on the platform and try and high noon everybody as the platform moves them into position. So both teams can take advantage of the platforms. But yeah, on the right-hand side, I think it's probably because the attacking team, as they're moving through Section 2, 
are constantly watching the the defenders running back from that direction and so i imagine it's just kind of like a subconscious thing where you feel like it's more trafficked by the defenders but in reality unless you're trying to flank there's almost no reason to go there for a defending team so i've had a lot of success going that direction but yeah i mean as, as far as the attacking team you definitely want to watch out for the platforms as i mentioned and also if you can get to the semi truck which is further down to the left hand side as you're attacking that's a really great platform to kind of pop up on top of and have a really good vantage point for the entire final encounter room where you're trying to push the payload to the finish line Uh, if you're playing a character like soldier or mccree and can get all the way down there you can cover your whole team pretty well and uh, the last thing i would say uh, just be aware when you're attacking It's very, very common for the defending snipers or bastions to set up right outside their spawn door because they do have a pretty good vantage point right as soon as they get out of the spawn where they can see the payload coming in. And either because of urgency or laziness or whatnot, like it seems like they're always going to set up right there. So be aware of that if you're playing a a flanking character like a Reaper or Tracer that you can do a lot of good for your team by just kind of patrolling back and forth between the two... Uh, spawn doors and just flanking uh, widows or bastions as they come out and set up yeah and that being said um, i'm glad you brought up the semi truck (laughs) because the semi truck is actually one of my favorite parts of the map it's actually uh this giant truck with an american eagle right on the side of it so if uh, it wasn't clear that route 66 took place in the usa it's right there in your face um but right behind the truck which is a second level area, there actually is a health pack as well. So it's a great place for a defending flanker to kind of keep their health up and then also shoot down at the attacking team. So it is a great area to really both hold. And then I feel like it's an area of priority. Like if you're holding that truck area, then you can really control the flow of the payload and uh, which team is going to win. So that area is very important, but also don't completely ignore the opposite area which if you're the attacking team is on the right the weapon storage um you can really come in from there flank and uh, i feel like a lot of people myself included don't really keep an eye on that area i mean it's a multi-level area it's a first and second floor in which you can come in with cover with a health pack and really flank the hell out of people that are trying to attack or defend the payload. So don't completely ignore that as well. That being said, the actual final payload area, which I think you're going to see is a trending detail with all of the payload maps, is completely wide open. So even though there are areas to snipe upon, to take cover, when if you want to stop the payload, you have to be next to the payload. So that being said, as an attacker, you know defenders need to get close to the payload your diva alt your rip tire even your reinhardt to with his hammer down just dropping the defending team Uh, this is the area of the map and i'm sure a lot of you guys can attest to this where things completely turn around you could be dominating on defense and then immediately go down uh from an alt so be super aware of that you want to really really try to stop the attacking team from getting to this area because at this point You're almost at a disadvantage. Yeah, it's quick to reach it from your spawn point, but um, you want to have your strategy. You want to communicate. You want to make sure everyone's doing what they can. And it's, you know, at that point, it really comes down to is the attacking team or the defending team more effective in this area? And I've seen it go both ways. I've had the heartbreaking loss on defense and I've had the uh, ridiculous, oh my God, we made it through last minute on attack and vice versa. So it's a super, super cool map, guys. And it's a whole lot of fun, especially towards the end. I mean, there's it's action-packed the whole way through. Yeah, that's actually a really good point you made um, about people having to get close to the payload to stop it and being aware of that. Uh, this isn't specific to payloads exactly because it could also apply to control points or capture points or anything like that, but... I mean, you can have the best alt in history in terms of effectiveness if you use your diva alt and the other team chooses not to run out and you capture the payload because of it. So, you know, if you're getting three meters away and you can ult, don't worry about waiting until you can see them. Just fire it off and know that you're going to make it to the end because if they run at the payload, they're going to die. And if they seek shelter from your ult, you won the game anyway. 
So, so using ults in a preventative manner. Oh yeah, especially yeah. considering Diva doesn't die from her own ult anymore. So you could literally drop the uh, self destruct on the payload and just stand there and continue moving the payload. Right, and it, yeah, Diva uh, is the first one that comes to mind when talking about that because you know there's a three second countdown before it detonates. So it's not you know something like Reapers where you use it and it lasts for a second, but instead you know they can't even come around the corner to start running at the payload for three seconds. So that's a really good one to buy some time. But just in general, I mean, just using ults in a preventative manner, I think, is underrated, but can be really, really effective. Because at the end of the day, the idea is to win the game, not to kill four people with your ult every time. So before we kind of finish off Route 66, let me go ahead and just uh, throw in some other fun Easter eggs about this uh, particular map, because there's a lot of just hidden information in the map uh well first off uh jeff just so you know the speed limit throughout all of route 66 is 35 miles an hour i know you like to go a lot faster than that but that is the speed limit so be aware of that i wish the payload went that fast sometimes (laughs) sometimes it doesn't move at all and that's extremely frustrating if you're on the (laughs) attack side um so yeah like Uh, We said before, the payload is a U.S. military bomb, so the whole story behind the map is trying to get the bomb to the Deadlock hideout, which is pretty cool. Um, On that note, uh, the Deadlock gang is actually the gang, and I think we mentioned it in the McCree episode, but I do want to bring it up again because it is relevant. McCree used to be part of the Deadlock gang. Um, The reason he's in Overwatch now is because the Deadlock gang was kind of... They they had a lot of power back in the day, so Overwatch decided that they needed to try and decommission the Deadlock Gang. So they put the Black Watch section of Overwatch, which was kind of their uh, shadow ops, their secretive section of Overwatch, uh, led by Gabriel Reyes, a.k.a. Reaper. So Reyes um, was in charge of taking out the Deadlock Gang, and uh, he did take out a lot of key members. He actually ended up capturing McCree, and when he saw the talent behind McCree, he decided, hey, instead of putting you in jail, let's go ahead and offer you a position in Overwatch. So you can either rot in jail or you could work for Overwatch. So that's kind of the story behind McCree. He ended up being captured and left the Deadlock Gang, joined Overwatch, and over his time with Overwatch, kind of doing great missions, helping people, he decided that, hey, maybe this is the right thing to do. So even though he's a vigilante, he's considered kind of a good guy. He's, he's that real Clint Eastwood type character. So that's really cool, but that's relevant because if you actually go through Route 66, there's a whole lot of areas um, behind the main desk at the diner on the attack spawn point, the very first attack spawn point, the panoramic diner, right behind the bar in the diner, and also um, a few other places, also including the second floor of the high side saloon uh there's a bunch of areas where mccree's photo and a machine gun (laughs) is right uh next to each other so the deadlock gang are not fans of mccree i think they feel like they've been betrayed and that mccree is now an enemy so uh, they are on high alert looking out for mccree and to shoot him even in a diner so uh that's pretty cool there's actually in the high side saloon there's actually even a, a dartboard with mccree's picture on the dartboard So if they haven't gotten it across, then, you know, they don't like McCree. Um, Another cool fact, you're going to find a bunch of clocks throughout the map in the diner, in the office of the Deadlock uh, base, and uh, just various areas throughout the map. Every single clock is actually set at 12 o'clock, which, uh, as we know, McCree's favorite time, high noon. Um, Every clock is set to high noon. So that's a pretty cool little detail that Blizzard dropped in there as well. There's payphones everywhere. If you remember what a payphone is, congratulations, you're old. A really interesting Easter egg. Uh, You guys wouldn't know this unless you played in the closed beta. Um, There is an outhouse right behind the high side saloon. So in section two, right behind the bar, there's an outhouse. You can actually shoot the door out of the outhouse. And uh, you could see that, you know, that's where people do their business. However, in the closed beta, there were actually magazines inside of the outhouse. So it was kind of an Easter egg in there. Uh, The magazines had pictures of Symmetra and Mercy in it. So, uh, Um, presumably members of the Deadlock gang were taking pictures of Symmetra and Mercy. And, uh, you know, they were just casually looking at them while hanging inside of the outhouse. So 
Um, just kind of adds to the scumbag nature of those characters. But uh, that has been since removed. I think Blizzard decided uh, maybe that wasn't a direction they wanted to go with their female characters. But, you know, that being said, those used to be there. Now they're not. But um, I also found, and uh, I, a lot of people have found, that um, there is uh, card games both inside the High Side Saloon and also in the Defending Spawn Point, so in the Deadlock Gang's hideout. The back of the cards are actually the logo for the Hearthstone game, which is a card game by Blizzard, so just another reference to one of their other games. So, yeah, all these really cool little details uh, dropped into the map. They kind of tell the story. There are references in Easter eggs, but also there are a whole bunch of uh, little details that, if you pay attention to, really tell the story of the game. Um, Overwatch doesn't have a story mode, but through their use of telling story through their animated shorts, through their media, through their website, and also through the maps, voice lines, things like that, we really get a rich lore for the game and its characters which i think is super cool yeah i agree they do a really good job of kind of setting the stage i feel like a lot of other fps games either have a story mode or wouldn't bother to put this level of detail and personality into their maps but the fact that they did it it just kind of builds out the world and it makes you feel like there's a reason you're doing the things you're doing at the end of the day it's really just about killing the other team or pushing the payload. But, hey, you've got a full minute while you're waiting for the match to start. Let's check out the posters on the wall. So just to kind of close it out and, and recap, this is absolutely one of my favorite maps. And I know you feel pretty strongly about it, too. Uh, it always feels fun to play this map, which I think is hard to achieve. In general, I think it's pretty balanced. I, I think Section 1 is pretty even uh, between the attacking and defending teams. Uh, when you push through the first checkpoint, I think it probably favors the attacking team a little bit. At least it feels that way to me. Usually the payload moves through there pretty quickly. But then everything changes at the end. It's always uh, the sight of the, the great epic stands and uh, the great battles for Route 66 is always uh, right at the end when you get through the uh, second checkpoint and push into the deadlock hideout where you get these uh, just totally different character selections and, and big fights. So I think that end part definitely favors the defending team being right next to their spawn. Oh, yeah, I'd have to completely agree. And um, I think as we cover the other maps, you know, uh, Jeff and I really do go in-depth. We're going to explore all of the maps in a custom game and really get the information. Uh, You're going to notice that, and you probably already have noticed, that the final section, especially of the payload maps, is generally where a lot of the chaos happens. I mean, the spawn point for the defensive team is right there, and it's usually pretty open. There's not a whole lot of cover for the defensive team. Uh, I think if this is by design, this is to give the defensive team a last straw chance to really uh, hold back the attack team and this is probably where you're going to see the most eliminations uh, in the game on both sides so yeah that was our uh, map breakdown of route 66 the uh, home of mccree Um, i hope you guys did learn a little something from this there's a lot of details in all of the maps Um, as we said before it's pretty well balanced i think most of the maps are pretty well balanced in the game Out of all the complaints I hear for the characters in Overwatch, I don't hear a lot of complaints about the maps. Uh, Everybody seems to enjoy most of the maps, so uh, Route 66 is no exception. Whole lot of fun on both attack and defense, so just really get familiar with it. Uh, Whether you're on attack or defense, you want to know your best flanking points, your best area for turrets, for specific characters, and really utilize it to the best of your ability. If there's any other... um, details, whether it be strategies, Easter eggs, things like that, that we may have missed on Route 66, feel free to contact uh, both me and Jeff. Um, You can reach us on Twitter. I am at HappyJamOP. And Jeff? I'm at TruthiterOP. And uh, you can also uh, email me directly at happyjamop at gmail.com. I do check that. So if you guys have uh, any suggestions for future episodes or just any feedback or uh, something you wanted to include, feel free to contact me. Check out our website as well, oppodcast.com. We have all of our uh, recent and past 
podcast episodes as well as other news. Um, you can check us out on Facebook. Just go on Facebook and search the OP Overwatch Podcast. We're on there as well. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope that this was helpful to you in some way. Jeff and I are going to go ahead and do uh, the map breakdowns for the remaining maps in Overwatch as well. Um, if you have one that you'd like to hear next, feel free to contact us and we'll uh, make sure to prioritize that one. We appreciate all of you guys listening and we look forward to talking to you next week. This has been the OP Overwatch Podcast.